there are a whole bunch of experiments going on at CERN. Most famously, the Large Hadron Collider is doing its thing. But one of the other experiments going on is that they're actually um, trying to produce anti-hydrogen. You know, we live in a universe made of matter. But um, a wonderful British physicist called Dirac demonstrated that there could be another class of particles which is called antiparticles. So every particle has its antiparticle, so for every proton there's an antiproton, for every electron there's a positron. Um, and so just as these elementary particles exist, in principle you can start putting them together to make composite things. So hydrogen, for example, consists of a proton and an electron. Now if you took an antiproton, the antiparticle of a, pro of a proton, and a positron, the antiparticle of an electron, and put them together, you could make anti-hydrogen. Back in the 1990s, early 1990s, it was demonstrated it was possible. They managed to combine a, the positron and an antiproton together, and they found uh, um, anti-hydrogen. But um, they couldn't stabilize it, because as, as soon as a particle and its antiparticle meet, they annihilate, they create energy, light. And uh, we're surrounded by matter, so if you create a little, an atom of anti-hydrogen, generally it was going to very quickly, and so it would just hit the wall of the container where, which it was in, hit the matter and immediately annihilate. So they, they, they demonstrated they could get it, but it, they couldn't keep it for any length of time. And so the new development is that they've actually found a way not only of making anti-hydrogen but actually trapping it with a strong magnet. You can actually create a, a magnet which holds these particles. They have trapped 38, I think it is, atoms or anti-atoms, if you like, atoms of anti-hydrogen. They've trapped 38 of them for about a sixth of a second. Right, so it doesn't sound great, but given that the natural time scale for these things to if, break up on is, you know, minuscule seconds, you know, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10 seconds, to be able to trap them, and that many of them, for a sixth of a second is a real achievement. And so they're using various combinations of very strong magnetic fields and electric fields, because you, to stop the particles, of course, they mustn't hit any matter because when matter and antimatter hit, they annihilate. It got, I, I think it's probably to do with Dan Brown and uh, his uh, um, somewhat uh, fanciful stories about the properties of, of antimatter and, and CERN, that it's got the publicity that it has um, in the sense that, you know, particle physicists have been making antiparticles for a very long time. It is a big breakthrough. What they are doing is very interesting. The excitement is you can now begin to do experiments, right? You can. You, because one of the big questions is, is, is the physics of antimatter the same as the physics of matter? Does it have the same properties? The slightly strange thing about it is that the most likely thing they're going to find is that antihydrogen is very boring, that it's basically indistinguishable from ordinary hydrogen. But at the moment you don't know, and the whole point of doing experimental physics is to try and find the unexpected. So for example, we don't even know at this point whether gravity works the same on antihydrogen and hydrogen. Are the energy levels of an anti-hydrogen atom exactly the same as the energy levels of a hydrogen atom. And so one of the experiments that they're going to be trying to do is figure out when you release these hydrogen atoms whether they accelerate due to gravity in the same way. Are the magnetic spins of the two particles exactly the same? And clearly if they didn't that would tell you something really rather fundamental about the laws of physics. It's expected that almost certainly they will tediously accelerate in exactly the same way. Um, but if you find the unexpected that's where the really exciting science lies. Antimatter is used, and um, who knows the applications? I'm, you know, I doubt Dirac, when he first came up with this idea of the antiparticle, realized that it would be saving lives, right? It's used day in, day out in the Queen's Medical Center across the road. The PET scanner is, the PET means positron emission tomography. They give you a fluid you, uh, which has got some radioactive substance in it, that radioactive substance decays very, very rapidly, and one of the decay products is the positron. So the positron, and it's, so it's circulating th across through your brain, and the positron's emitted. Of course, it's emitted very slowly. It's a, it's a, it's a very slow process. So it comes, uh, it comes out very slowly. It immediately hits an electron, right, which is somewhere in your brain, and when matter and antimatter hit, they annihilate, and so it produces light and you pick that light up in the, through a detector. You know, you, you, you're, you're lying in a, in a PET scanner. And, and, and so by doing it, they can map the brain, and they can map regions of the brain that have, you know, they can, they can look for problems in their um, growths of cancers and things. In some sense, 
antimatter is sort of the ultimate source of energy in, in that if you take a bit of antimatter and a bit of matter and you combine them together, you get pure energy out. You can turn that mass into pure energy via Einstein's famous E equals mc squared equation. And always one of the issues with that is, well, that's fine, but how do you store your antimatter? Because, of course, as soon as it comes into contact with regular matter, it annihilates. And so you need some way of storing it. And so one of the practical aspects of this research kind of a long way down the line is they've clearly started to find ways to actually hold antimatter and reasonable amounts of antimatter. The reason why the energy you get out of these things is, at least in principle, dangerous is because going back again to Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, c is a big number, c squared is a very big number, which means that for a relatively small amount of mass m, you get a lot of energy E. And so as soon as you start getting up to sort of macroscopic amounts, like grams of, of mass, then the energies you, you release really start getting quite scary. Um, but in this case, they're creating collections of, of you know, thousands to millions of atoms. And so on that kind of scale, you're still talking about such a tiny mass m that the e that you get out, even when you multiply it by these big c squared, is still tiny. So you know, it's really still not a, a major security issue.